This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. It is Off Planet Radio tonight because one of our guests is camera shy, which means I get a night off of having to wear makeup and I'm enjoying the pleasure of doing the show from my pajamas. So that said, um, I have a great show for you tonight. Unfortunately, Randy is not with me. He wanted very badly to be a part of this show. Uh, the show was supposed to originally have been recorded a week ago, but he was not feeling well. And so we rescheduled it. And last night he called me and told me he was still not feeling well. Um, and he's been struggling with his health for a bit now, and he's just doing what he needs to do to take care of himself. So we will miss Randy greatly tonight, but we will send him all of our well wishes for a speedy recovery and for just um, a new level of health for him in this new year. So with that out of the way, I'm going to introduce our guests. It's been a while since they've been with us, and they have one of my favorite and weirdest presences on the internet in their main show and all of their extracurricular activities. Uh, with me tonight are Nish and Jerry from Nox Mente, Obelisk, Cruising with Steak, and other shows. Hey guys, welcome back. Good to talk to you. Weirdest presence on the internet? <laughs> what? Yeah. I love that. Weird with the Y. Yeah, so... <laughs> Maybe we'll get to, uh, well, since this is audio, but I have, the video is going as well. So if I want to screen share at some point during this, um, there's a lot of people who listen to our show and who probably have heard your Knox Mente shows that aren't aware of your artistic presence on the internet, Nish. And so maybe later in the patrons hour, we'll share some of that. And um, that is certainly unusual. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, I had a feeling you were you were talking about that. Yeah, definitely. And I like being in the weird, strange underground sector. That's where I live. Yeah, yeah. me too. I mean, You're... there's no other place to be for us. <laughs> totally. I mean, Viva la weird. <laughs> for me, this stuff is like uh, the under, like the dance music scene is for me. I never liked the big festivals. Like there was a time when I first started getting into it that I liked going to some of like medium sized raves or whatever when I, you know, when it was back in the rave days, but everything that I've done in the last 20 years, I have no interest in that. I like the shit that's in like the dark, dirty warehouse on the grossest corner of East LA, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, you have to kind of park in a scary place to go to the party, but it's, you know, there's just a, you know, small amount of people there. Sometimes there's actually a lot, but you know, they are fully music nerds and that's kind of how I feel about this stuff we do with the alternative media. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like that mainstream thing. And even sometimes like when we have a show that does really well, or we go through a phase where we're getting a lot of views, it's a mixed feeling for me because I like the underground aspect of off planet radio. And I feel like you guys do a really good job at maintaining that. I mean, your guys' stuff is great. So sometimes I'm like, why don't more people listen to this? But also thank God more people don't listen to this. Yeah, right. we are. We're we're in that zone for sure. It's and we're totally underground. But it, it's uh, I, I don't know. I'm always. It's no surprise for me. I love being in the underground. And I. It's interesting you say that because I was just listening to the late latest show that Randy posted uh, that we talked about earlier, and he was talking about this very same thing on that and uh, how he he does prefer you know being in the underground always has and so mm -hmm. you know here we are i feel like there's something that keeps us credible if we're constantly if we're not seeking out that kind of like fame and fortune and visibility the way that some others do it does happen and mm -hmm. if it happens organically that's fine but the way that people do it with buying views buying likes but you know all that stuff that's just crazy for yeah. the sake you know, we'll get accused of being chills or Patsies, right. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Like we're going, we're getting to this weird place right now where even like, you know, people who are like, sometimes that happens organically, right. That somebody goes from being, you know, having a small niche audience to suddenly because of their work on one or two issues or having, you know, or something like that. Right. It goes up, 
you know, up overground and, and people start paying a lot of attention and whatnot and offers come their way. And sometimes they're able to hold on to it in terms of they don't go with any of that stuff. But even right now, even if you've grown in like an organic way and you're doing a lot of stuff that you do on YouTube as you and I, you guys do and, and we do, there's this one that, that you're blocked from doing certain things if you're not willing to monetize. Like, you know, yeah. like Robert and I are wanting to add super chat to some of our shows, right? So people can like, you know, co donate to comment and have us ask their questions and stuff like that, right? With the Matrix Mass show. And you're not allowed to use super chat unless you monetize your channel and let them put, like, I just, I can't do that. So that's an automatic, you know, like mm -hmm. it's different than taking sponsors. You know what I mean? But I'm not going to do that. Like I can't, I can't take myself seriously if there's possibly going to be an ad for shell oil or for any of anything, you know, that plays before my show. <laughs> well, you can, well, there always is ads playing before your show for people who don't pay, but you can always monetize and not monetize your videos. Monetize your channel, but don't turn on monetization for your, for your videos. And that way you get super chats. Well, that's interesting. Good but this also brings up a bigger point too, and definitely one that affects me. I would like to, make a little money. I put a ton of time and effort into everything I do online these mm -hmm. days. Yep. And I mean, I haven't seen one cent. And so like, yep. I, I'm just now putting together a Patreon page. I'd like to, I, all my videos and all my art is free and downloadable and people do it and it, it goes all over. You know, I hear Russia is really enjoying stuff. And uh, I would like to at least get a little, I don't have to be gigantic. And in fact, I usually run the other way when that's happened in the yeah. past, but a little something, something would yeah. help. And, and trust me, when people come at me with ideas for a little something, something, they've got my ear these days. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's hard, you know, but especially with someone who makes such unique and statement style of music and art like you do, there is something that just cheapens it if there's an ad for Shell Oil right before it, right? So like, you know what I mean? Like, you, it's hard. It's just one of these hard things. And also, obviously, we don't believe in some of that crap and whatnot. But yeah, I, I, I get you. It's, you know, it's, there's a million it's so interesting and it's so blessed my life to be able to do this stuff and to have an audience of people, not only that listen to us, but that we get to interact with and we get to have friends that are into the same stuff as you are and whatnot. But there's also some stuff that goes along with it that at a certain point, you don't really think when you're first getting into it. And what you're talking about, Nish, is one of those things. And it is like at a certain point, like how do I value my time and my effort, and my energy and my creativity and the thing that makes me unique from everybody else? Yeah, it's, I mean, this is a, you know, people talk about this a lot and it's a big subject and, uh, it, you know, it's got a lot of controversy too. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a hot, hot subject, yeah. but like I keep saying, like I, a lot of people make money off my back. I do a lot of free shows for people that are actually making money mm -hmm. on their shows and mm -hmm. I bring in views for them. And so at some point I'm like, Hey, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's fair for me to want a little something for my time and effort. And, uh, and if nothing else being interesting enough that people actually am grateful that people yeah. actually follow what I do. Well, and you always bring it right. And, you know, and, and Jerry, you do as well. Like I've never heard either one of you show up and be like, hey, I'm kind of tired today and I'm not really engaging. You know what I mean? You always show up. You're always weird. You're always engaging, both of you. And I feel like I do the same thing. Like I never show up for an interview with not much to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. And there are lots of examples of terrible interviewees out there, interviewers out there that... Uh, Karen Cassidy. Excuse me. Uh, no, see, I, you and I are going to differ on that. I hate that, that uh, I mean, a lot of people are, but no matter what, she trailblazed. And it's hard, I'm telling you, it's hard as a woman in this field. And I'm not pulling a Me Too card here. You know me better than that, Jerry. <laughs> but I'm saying that she has had to cut through some water to get where she is. And I don't think she's a shill. And I think that... I think she should get some respect. That's where I come from with that perspective on her. I was just kidding. So, 
<laughs> well, no, a lot of people, it seems, you know, she's controversial in for some reason and people really like her or they really hate her. And I'm saying, let's just respect what she's had to do to get to where she is. People are really mean to her. And, uh, yeah, and, so and that's part of this greater conversation that we're talking about. It's, 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 it's about how do we move forward fairly and in a cool way that's not like where we're clearly in it for the money or we're clearly uh, not talented and, uh, and, and still trying to get something for not being talented. Right. You know, where's the, where's the fine line here and how do we get on that track? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, so I, I partly agree with both of you because since, since Jerry said that I have an inkling, I know what his feelings are about it. And if I'm wrong, he can correct me. And, you know, I don't, um, I, I, uh, one of my um, features as both an interview E and an interviewer is I don't, uh, I don't speak, you know, about other people in the media very often unless they're doing, you know, like at least to criticize them unless they're doing something that I think is totally immoral and dangerous. You know what I mean? Um, but I think the people, people's problem with Carrie and for, I do agree with you that she, especially at the time she started, she was stepping into a boys club. Right. And so she had to um, be formidable in order to like, be taken seriously or whatnot. And I think, unfortunately, she developed a style of like talking to people that was very confrontational and undercutting and, and not, not, you know, and so some people don't like that. But also, she did some, um, you know, I don't I haven't listened to her in years, but like I know that you came to some of this stuff maybe a little later than, than, uh, than when I did or some other people did. And she did some things that really damaged um the people who had been part of projects and programs that were trying to sort of be taken seriously to, and, and whether it was her intention to make them look um ridiculous or unreliable or or whatever whether that was her intention or not that's what happened and so there was a lot of people who really didn't appreciate it and that started that ball rolling for what you're talking about nish and then the way she responded by it sometimes was to like double down so it got worse on worse on both sides then but there were certain conversational topics that did not exist in the alternative media really at least in any way more than just a few, few tiny views on things shows people never heard of until she brought some of them forward so i do think I, you know, it's a balance here. We have to find a balance of like, you know, we, we appreciate, we have to be honest about the things that are uh, respectable and appreciate, you know, the, the people, when people do good work and then also when it's not so good, be able to, to say so without it being an attack on the person in a way that is mean or unfounded. Right. And, and I'm just coming from this perspective that, uh, that I, I just don't like talking. There's enough channels out there that where they're attacking each other. And Carrie's, of course, mm -hmm. one of those people that people love to attack. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's unfair. I think yeah. we should just keep names out of it and quit yeah. going for each other's throats. And I'm so tired of it. And I think everyone, especially concerning the a lot of stuff that Carrie is notoriously famous for, even if she's involved or not, is like, let's just all stop talking about Corey Good and David Wilcock. <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's just stop talking about it. I don't care totally. to hear one more video saying this and that and look where they are. It's hey, just you brought it up. No, but I mean, <laughs> Car Carrie, you brought it up by saying Carrie because she's intricately tied into all that. And so inevitably... I just want they to clarify. Bring her in. I was talking about her interview style as I know, Emily Jerry. Was. Yeah, not her personally or anything she's done. Just I know, but it's she's like your favorite to cough and say that because about. she's the most abrasive. Well, she had to be, and that's what I'm saying. And so, it, it was in context. It was it was something that had she had no choice, and it, it's sad. And also, I'm also about. Lately, I've just been noticing this. See, this is more like a conversation I'll have like JJ and BB or Solaris and Montana on these other shows I do. But it, it seems like it, it, it is 
were ch- the girls I'm encountering this right now. I have several girls on the scene that just hate me. I had to look them up. I had to look two of them up. I had no idea who they are. So they somehow I have triggered them in some way mm-hmm. and they've got good shows. They've got shows that are out there like radio. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, who is this person? And why are these comments coming back about me? And then I go look and I'm like, as with everything in the outer world in my entire life, usually those pointing their finger at me saying nasty stuff are people I'd never want to be, never want to be like, uh, and aspire to, in fact, they inspire me to be more myself and continue on this sovereign, you know, this sovereignty uh, feel to hold my own agency. And I'm just not going to address it at all. The, and these have been personal attacks towards me, um, and it's a, and they're and it's women. I'm so shocked because I'm so pro woman without being a me tour, and uh, and so I just I, I just kind of kind of want to do that because I see an upsurge in this happening right now, Emily. And so I, I know what you're talking about because I, I mean I think you're in the stage with your media presence now that like I was at two years into mine right where like your, your name is out there you're starting to get more attention you're having more opportunities and i will say you're, you're right the only people on attacks that i have ever gotten are for, are from women from other yeah. people in the media i never talk you know like i don't i'm not going to say who they are they're all people i've never met they yes. are all people i've never talked to same um, they're all saying things that like don't make any sense to me um <laughs> and so i yet. don't even know what they're talking about generally <laughs> Um, you know, and so I just don't, um, I agree with you. There is a feature of this like cattiness, which I'm like, is completely in my entire life, but that is not, I'm not into that. And what's that resulted for me is that I, most of my friends for most of my life have been men. Yeah. Um, that's a common story. Yeah. I mean, really the only, um, female friends I have in the alternative media are you, Sonia and Danny Cat. Uh, yes, also. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, but so, every- so maybe that's the, the thing here is that you two have mostly male friends and you get attacked by the females and that maybe it's something related to that that you don't. These females have mostly all fel- male friends when I look too. Like yeah. that's mm. it's it's in mm-hmm. it's there. Chicks yeah, are so, catty. Chicks are catty. Yeah. That's what can I say? It's, it's, it's unfortunate. It's a, it is unfortunate though. And, but that's something I've noticed my whole life. I mean, I happen to be raised by my father. So maybe like mm, my tolerance for some of the things that most, that <laughs> for some things that women do, like I never learned about those things because my mom wasn't around. You yeah. know what I mean? And so my tolerance for them was small. They're all um, just jealous. But I will say this. like No, like, this, see, this is, Jerry's bringing up a I good point here, Emily. And it's, it, it's not that chicks are catty. It's that we've been playing, and everyone knows, everyone knows that I am not, I'm not pro one or the other. And uh, so I'm not a man hater. I want to put that out there. Definitely not a man hater. Yeah, me but it, it, we've been brought up in a system that makes it harder there are less, there have been until now, and now it's pounds tipping in the other side, but we've been brought up in the system where it's been heavier with the men and, and the women have had to fight harder. And sadly, a lot of that has been at a very catty level about stupid, stupid stuff. So, and and it doesn't show well. So, I, I mean, that, I, I agree with you about it not showing well. Like for me, I had never... I actually had never thought about it until you brought it up to me when we were chatting. I don't know. It was like maybe what six weeks ago and you first mentioned it to me. And I was like, oh, yeah, I actually come to think of it. There aren't that many women who have broken through to like the really successful level in the alternative media. Like most of like, you know, I, so I hadn't thought about it. Right. And yeah, you know, I, I guess I don't think about those things really. Like I, I don't know if it's just cause maybe like I am so in touch with my masculine aspects that I don't, <laughs> Like, I just don't, you know, I don't, I don't think of it that way or partly I, you know, I experienced some of that stuff uh, when I was coaching gymnastics back. Like I don't, I haven't coached in a number of years, but back in the like mid nineties when I was coaching and sometimes I had issues with the male coaches um, and I just kind of got over it. And so it's not, I just, it's not something that I've really thought about a lot. Um, I also like, I've had wonderful outreach and wonderful uh, experiences with, 
uh, the, my, the, the female like listeners and followers and stuff like that. So I guess I've more focused on that. And, and I've had all around great experiences with men on both sides and it, it, other men who are in the alternative media and the, the ones who are listeners. So uh, maybe I'm just having an anomaly here, but I hadn't even thought about it. So you said it when you brought it up, I did, I did, I had to agree that I couldn't really think of very many. So. Yeah, it's I'm I have I have amazingly incredible experiences with anyone that gets in close and you yep. know the simile. Yeah. And so they're deep, we talk about deep things. I mean, these kinds of conversations are natural and it's not like we're just the camera goes on. Let's get deep. These are my natural conversations and where they flow. And uh, and so I had just noticed when I looked around and I started to. And again, this was one of those things where I'm looking at some of the people being all the shade, you know, all the tea was uh, happening towards certain people. And I noticed it happened to be a lot of attacks towards the females. And it, it was, it's just interesting. I actually had to put my eye on it because I don't pay attention either. Yeah. And, and something brought it up. And then I went and I looked and I realized, oh, yeah, I mean, really, in the alternative media, the the female names are very few, yeah. and and you know, and some of them I'm just completely opposite of. Where I, I mean, I didn't even know who they were, yeah, and so, yeah. you know, it's just something I'm noticing, and I'm not saying it is like a me tour. You know, I think that movement was completely. Uh, the way we all think that was set up it's social engineering and all that uh but i'm saying that just as a person in this genre and now starting to get really crazy feedback from some mm. people that are, you know things are being said and it's like oh <laughs> i'm not yeah. even i barely even show myself <clears throat> i find it interesting that uh well, I don't find it interesting. I understand why it doesn't attract women. I, uh, the alternative space is a lot like comic books and and D and D and stuff. It just attracts men more than women, mm -hmm. and it takes a certain type of woman to be attracted to that field. I think that's kind of my take on it. Why well, do you why. think that is, Jerry? And I think that's a good point. And I also I believe. I feel I feel oneness with you on that. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't have an answer for that. It's just it's just the same. I would bucket it into the same category. You know, like there are things that dudes do <laughs> that very few <laughs> women do. Right. And some women are attracted to that. Usually, so I, women who yeah. have a lot of male friends. <laughs> yeah. So I I I'm not sure I 100% understand why, but I would agree that that is true. I I agree with you. Guys, I think um, maybe two things I can add to this. I do notice that um, when women are attracted to alternative information in general, it tends to be their path then is generally more from a health and wellness perspective. And then sometimes they might find their way into the conspiratorial realm or the, you know, the political and conspiratorial realm. Um, but if you do look at like, okay, in the alternative health stuff, you do have some bigger female names like your uh, health nut news, Aaron, my yeah, brother, you yes. know, Aaron, yeah, the one who's doing Dr. Mercola. And there's yeah. a few with like women who are very big in that space. Um, whereas like the men tend to come in through a, cons a political like avenue in or maybe conspiratorial or like weird stuff. And then eventually after kicking and screaming and fighting for a number of years, they'll realize that there's a health aspect of this too. So it's kind of like you come in through different doors and eventually you realize, Oh, it's all the same fucking thing. It's, you know, it's all part of the same thing. <laughs> it's all woven. <laughs> but, but I will say this. And one of my bigger complaints about the alternative media and the conspiratorial realm, um, is that, um, it tends to be right in nature in terms of, I don't mean that everybody in the alternative media is right leaning, but they've usually come from, come in from more frequently. They've come in from the right than in from the left. For some reason, left people seem offended by the idea of conspiracy theory and they don't generally go there unless they were left with no choice, but to go there, like they've tried every other explanation. And because one of the features of, people in general or historically has been, I don't know that it's so much that way anymore, but this is a shift that's just happened in the last few years is that people on the right tend to be more conservative. And so like the, it, it is a different set of roles 
for men and for women for people who come from a more conservative background than people who come from a more progressive left kind of background. So that would be like one explanation that I could find. Um, the other is that like, mm, there are certain kinds of intricacies and to some of the information in the conspiratorial realm, especially when you get into some of the, you know, more the weirder, the woo and the, and the mind control and some of the quantum physics kind of stuff and whatever that really turn you and I on niche, but maybe for some women that isn't their thing. They're coming from a more feeling space or, you know what I mean? Like they don't like the idea of a cold, hard world and whether or not you, whether or not you or I like that idea, like we are, we have a certain from our backgrounds, understanding that that there's a lot of reality to that and so not being interested in it is not helpful what do you guys think about that uh, i i agree i tend to agree with that and i mean as a person who's like you know from the moment i was able to think questioning and this goes to the parental level who why do i need to be governed you know like <laughs> like what are these parental units doing? And, uh, and <laughs> parental, I used to call them parental units. That's when I was a teenager. I referred to them as my parental units. <laughs> and, yeah. and questioning everything, you know, like that whole stereotype, why sky blue and the grass green and all that. And so I've, I've always come from that space of questioning my reality. And then when you question your reality, ultimately, I think you're going to get to what we all get to is what is going on with being governed at this mm -hmm. level. And so, and then that can certainly boil down into right, left type paradigms. I don't, I'm interested in Jerry's take on that. Jerry? I forgot the question already. Well, I just, what you thought about what I said about perhaps the reason why, and from my view, why the alternative space uh, or the conspiratorial attracts. space attracts more men. Uh, well, I already th I already said why I think that's because it's a guy. No, no, but about what I said about that. Oh, you said it was more right leaning than left. That, like that, that part of the reason that that is is because like most of the men who are in the alternative media, right, or most of the people who are in the alternative media or conspiratorial space, tend to have originated from the right or from more conservative protectionist kind of background. I, I would that, say more libertarian. I would agree if you're if you're saying the libertarian as the right type of the right leaning type of libertarian, right? Because there's a right libertarian, there's a center left kind of libertarian, and then there's different kinds of anarchy that go from all sides. But right. just in terms of like the tradition of the alternative media, the way it came up, like with your Bill Coopers and your Alex Jones is and whatever and all that kind of stuff, that your Jeff Frances, your Jack Bloods, all that kind of stuff. Right. Like they were the people who really started some of this space. And then there was like Art Bell and whatever, but it all was a little bit more people who came at least initially from the right. They may have right. found their way to outside of it all. Right. Right. But so I, th I, what I think generally is that the, the mainstream media, the, the global narrative is a left leaning one. Totally. So any dissent to that, if you, if you have, dissenting thoughts, you're going to be attracted to people who speak to those topics, like mm -hmm. a Bill Cooper. Oh, yeah. So I think that's how a lot of these people like Cooper, Joe, Alex Jones, uh, I can't think of anyone else at the moment, but th those types of individuals yeah. will attract these people who have considered the alternative. Who like don't, you know they don't buy the either they're they're right leaning to start with or they're left and on the cusp or whatever. Yeah. Personally, I was a lifelong Democrat until like 2012. Mm -hmm. You know, I voted Democrat every year. I was all into Obama. You know, all that shit. Mm -hmm. But now the Democratic Party is just, and I'm not trying to bring politics to this, but they're just oh, not. Oh, no, we can go there. Since I forgot to tell everybody what we're kind of talking about, uh, and I didn't know idea if the conversation was going to go where it's gone. <laughs> That's not anything we talked about. It's a stream of consciousness. It's a yeah. stream of consciousness, but we decided that in the first hour, we'd talk about sort of what's going on in the external world, and that, that is what we're talking this, this, yeah. about. This is that. So please, if you, it, it's not, it's absolutely acceptable to All bring right. politics into this, because I was going to go there with you. 
guys anyway. So. so the Democratic Party has just become something that I don't recognize anymore. Nothing mm-hmm. I want to be a part of either. It's, uh, it's like a party of NPCs now. If you don't tote the party line, you're, you're, you're canceled. <laughs> right. Or, or taken offline, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, Jerry, I was a lifelong, I mean, I've never voted for anybody other than a Democrat. Yeah, me neither. Um, but I, so for me, um, and my family is very left-leaning. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there are members in my family that, in my opinion, border on um, certain aspects of um, Fabianism or communism. You know what I mean? Like that kind, right. you know, right, right, that right, kind right. of thing. And um, I was not really exposed to other stuff other than the fact that my mom worked for an oil company. And so she understood some of the financial benefits of Republican agendas. And so sometimes... Like I think at what one time for some reason she did vote one time for a Republican, you know what I mean? And but that was it. But I never voted for anyone but a Democrat. And then, you know, I voted for Obama the first time in two thousand and eight. And within about three weeks of his taking office, I realized I had been horribly <laughs> fooled. And, you know, I was already waking up to sort of conspiratorial things before that, but it was more like nine eleven, chemtrails, whatever. But I realized how I had been completely brainwashed and mind controlled by this Obama character. And it started me looking into stuff. I'd say within three months, I was like a libertarian. And another month or so, I was an anarchist or a voluntarist. And I've never had anything to do with anything political. I've never voted ever since. I've never, I just don't, I, I watch it. I comment it. I make fun of it, but I don't join causes. I don't protest. I don't do any of that stuff because yeah, I realized what are, it was. So I'm coming from a similar space as you then. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the night, the, one of the interesting things that I've seen happen is that the, as the Democrats have gained, have made identity politics the, the forefront of their plank, if you will, the Republicans have dropped it completely. Mm-hmm. They're not, you know, sure there's some anti-abortion people out there, but that doesn't affect me personally anymore, mm-hmm. and I'm not really concerned. You know, it's not my, it's not my core issue at the moment. So what's interesting is uh, even when I was a Democrat and I was quiet about this when I was a Democrat, I've actually um, for for many for a long time before I was ever apolitical, I was actually a kind of secret pro-lifer. Um, you know, like I, I do I did firmly believe that, like, ultimately a woman has the right to choose. Uh, and that choice also includes choosing to, like, use a condom or birth control or whatever. But that it, it should be like that it was not something I don't like this casual attitude of like, oh, well, I'll just get an abortion or let's, you know, I don't like this whole thing with Planned Parenthood in like poor neighborhoods. I, did, I never liked that. It was something that made me uncomfortable about the Democrats. Um, I never think that a person doesn't have the right to choose for their own body, but I don't think it should be just so um, acceptable and normalized and something that people should be that there should be like this conversation. I mean, some of these conversations that happen about, you know, abortions after birth and stuff like, you know what I mean? I'm just yeah. like, what world are we fucking in? Um, so, yeah, so I get it. My, one of the things I wanted to say though, was what you said about these guys who were disaffected and so they were attracted to a Bill Cooper, right? But because Bill Cooper was speaking language that they could understand and part of the thing with those people, and I, this was my, was my point before, is that maybe they're a little bit more traditionalist and conventional, right? And so it's kind of like men do this and women do that. And that's why women weren't attracted to, because those people, it was like the men over there doing their thing, right? Like that, and th- that was a pl- uh, something like, a, like, you know, men don't go, the women don't go to the Elks Lodge. That's something the boys do, right? And right. the way that the energy coalesced around the alternative media in its founding days was just something that not very many women felt like they either could or wanted to approach the same way they don't generally join the outside. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, um, do, let's keep, Nish, did you have anything else you wanted to say about this? I had no idea we were going here, but I didn't. If you, oh, uh, see, I love these organic flows. Me too. Yeah, yeah, and, me too. And this is, and Jerry and I definitely thrive on this kind of let it go where it's going to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is, you know, I, I am not a group person. And so I didn't even really pay attention to politics, even though my mother was deeply involved with stuff that I didn't actually learn about until later. I, I would have never known as a child. I mean, I, 
now, now I know, and looking back, I know. And ironically, it's her death date today. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, I know, 20 years. I know you were very, years. I know you had a very in, special relationship with your mother, so. She was the goddess to me. I yes. loved her. So my yeah. condolences and my, and, and you know. Hello to Michelle it has out a, there, wherever you are. <laughs> yeah, she is wonderful. And that's a whole different story for a different day. But so I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't coached. Where I was coached politically was in the school system. And I remember like the Reagan, the Reagan in specific, Reagan and uh, Carter, that whole thing. And uh, I remember being very acutely aware of this as a, in elementary school and and the the slant at which the teachers were pushing and uh i i felt that i felt that felt it felt strange like i was being told what to to think and Mm -hmm. that was my first did it feel did it feel politically leaned though like i i I, I, the the the, the being told what to think part i totally agree with but did you feel because you're we're about the same age so did you feel all the way back then that they were trying to push you in a certain direction socially I, or politically? Yes, Emily, but not to the degree they are now. Okay. And it was dependent on the teacher and so and their views. But I, I started to f- kind of get a slant. And then, you know, I, I, I didn't really pay attention to politics. I seriously didn't. I didn't realize... Any of, none of that really existed for me until years, 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 years later. Mm-hmm. And um, you probably and, didn't really become aware of some of that stuff, like the outer workings of that stuff. So you moved to San Francisco. Yeah, it's much more political than where you came from. Right. Well, in San Francisco, I learned po- politics in a very in the in the the trickle down way. Right. So if it's yellow, let it mellow. If it's brown, flush it down. Water conservation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in San Francisco, back in the eighties, they were uh, recycling. That was on her. That wasn't even a word in Iowa mm-hmm. <laughs> at the time. And it took uh, you know, I think a decade later for it to even be a thing. And uh, so, but in San Francisco, we did at the time. I mean, now San Francisco is a bloody mess. But don't get me started. But <laughs> it was. It was in the eighties. It was still a gorgeous place yeah. to be and there was still a sense of beauty and there wasn't trash everywhere and feces and it didn't smell like you know the hot spots in paris where it was it smells like piss and cigarettes you know like yeah uh like new orleans oh God, well, new orleans, orleans worst. yeah well new orleans has that old world feel and that's very much part of a lot of old European cities that smell yeah. and reminds me of New Orleans. Well, the anyway, that the water drainage and sewage systems aren't great, so stuff just sits around. For yeah, a it's yeah. just got that. It's got that. It's got a certain je ne sais quoi. Totally. And I'm a little romantic for New Orleans in that way, but so I didn't notice it until then, and I certainly didn't start thinking about being involved in a party at all and i was basically going along with the program program Mm -hmm. and so that program because of the people i was around all the time you know mostly edgy artists and stuff seemed to be democratic right yeah back in the day yeah back in the day it was like all it seemed like all the people i loved were democrats and all the people i respected that were artistic and wild and you know free and all this were democrats and and just like the both of you said earlier it was during the obama reign (laughs) where i voted for obama and then i started to go i started to actually go to whitehouse.gov, right? And look mm-hmm. at where he's putting his name. I mm-hmm. thought I wasn't listening to propaganda. I was actually looking at where he's putting his name. And then I started to sound out. I was like, okay, he's saying, he's kind of like saying this, is the whole Hegelian thing. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, but people look at, so I started to be ostracized immediately when I spoke up against it. And I'm just like, look at this. Look what he signed. Look what he did here. Look mm-hmm. what he did here. This is all big government. This is all heading towards crazy, crazy, like, Camo Chinese uh, communist government shit. Yeah, and yeah. and like crazy, you know, some socialism and all this, and uh, on the 
crazy end. And, and I started to lose friends really fast. And I, that's when I left Facebook actually. And then here I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for both of you because it's not, uh, you know, to, I've talked to Nish privately much more than I've talked to you, Jerry, but I've known you longer. Um, and I've never had a political private conversation with either of you. So where do you guys stand politically? Do you, do you guys still vote? Are you still involved in the political system? Or have you long since abandoned it like I have? No, I'm, I'm not political. I try to stay out of politics as much as possible. I do not vote. I think it's a energetic contract that sucks your soul. <laughs> yeah. Ditto. Absolutely not having it. In fact, yeah. I'm, I'm just having to go through getting a new driver's license. And now that all the rules That's in the so states annoying. are, the states are changing. And so now you have to have these special licenses to get across. I think October is the date anyway, to get across straight state lines now, like you used to have to just to get to Canada. Like and you that. live right over the border of your state, right? So you cross a lot. So yeah, well, I don't go out. Oh, there's my dog. I'm going to pause doggy. for a minute. Um, yeah. So, okay. But I voted no. I mean, I said no on voting. And so that's where that is. I mean it. I'm not participating. It is interesting that, that of all the conversations you have, I didn't have had niche off, off the air. We've never talked about voting or politics or anything. We never talk about that. Right? Because we never really, this isn't actually a subject we talk about, but it is interesting. Yeah. It's interesting yeah. to kind of talk about this a little in the air of contemporary society. Well, and just what's the madness that's going on right now. I mean, I, Randy and I, every once in a while we'll get into political stuff, but it's not something that we do a lot on off planet but i do do it with robert and with danny um, and people seem to even though i have no interest like in that it, it gives me sort of a bird's eye view because i don't care or i can just see very clearly like, oh look i see what's happening it's this and it's kind of funny to hear you know someone who gives no shits just say it right um you know danny is, is much more like involved in the kind of political stuff and whatnot so we do i do talk about it sometimes you know, I do talk about it quite a bit on the air, but it's, you know, it's my, my life and my mood and my um, relationship with myself is much different since I stopped caring about politics, right? When people get all upset with me because I don't vote, I say, I, what I tell them is I, I don't write letters to Santa Claus either. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, <laughs> it, you know, <laughs> Danny and I had, a, our last episode was called, was titled, yeah, and I don't write letters to Santa Claus anymore either. You know? Yeah, that. there's too many people who believe their vote counts. Right. Yes. Well, yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so for me, like, I, the, a love, there was a certain agitation and frustration that see, seemed I, like I couldn't overcome in, until I stopped thinking that, like, that someone was going to do something about something like even still lots of people I love are still political and still believe that. And I hear things from them. Like, why isn't someone doing anything about this? Right? Like, why is this being allowed to happen kind of thing? And that space, when I was in that, it, I was constantly bub bumping up against this agitation. Like there was just this edge to me that was like, you know, edgy. It was like, you know, after you've been up all night partying or something all night, right? That was just, you know, you know, kind of that kind of thing. And um, not caring has take, takes that away. <laughs> All I see when I look at this system is a is is basically mafia. Mm -hmm. There, it's a thug system where if mm -hmm. you don't pay your dues and they get want their dues at every turn, you see some hardcore consequences you have no choice to opt out and those who try to opt out we see what happens mm -hmm. they might have be there might be some legal ease through like common law and all that that, that just uh, puts you on another list though it puts you on another list it targets you and it, again more thuggery yeah. and so all i see is this is a pl a prison wheel where this is this is modern day slavery whether people want to feel triggered by that word or not there's no other way 
to put it. And that's the way it's chattel. And I learned about that world when I took word when I took classes in Chicago at Malcolm X. Thank you very much. And um, I did that intentionally. It, you know, it's a kind of a rough neighborhood. And I, I went in, I just wanted to see what was going on with it, what was making that a little bit different. And, and immediately, you know, I was confronted with all that kind of stuff. So they were teaching right out the gate um, about, I was basically going in, I have done this. I'll go in and see what something's about. So I took some classes there. I paid for them, took them. And, uh, and immediately that's where I really learned the deeper sense of the, the word chattel. Like it was Mm -hmm. like in the very first of a creative writing class. (laughs) Um, and you know, that was, that was the whole class talking about that word. Well, that word's Mm -hmm. very important. And it's, it's, can you, can you just in case there are people, cause I do meet people who don't know what that means. Uh, Can you get, go ahead and give people the definition of what chattel is, you know, obviously it sounds like cattle and that's closer to the truth. So, (laughs) so yeah. Right. (laughs) You know what? I think the proper thing to do, and hopefully Jerry's on this is to just look it up and read it so that that it's not paraphrased. I I think it's an amalgam of, of chafe, chafe and cattle. Chaff yeah. and cattle. So something yeah. you'd throw out as a target for incoming, you know, as a, what do they call it? Set like a sacrifice. Well, if you, but if we cattle. just read the proper definition and uh, I'll just. I'm getting it for you right here. Hold I on. Thank you. I got it. I got All it. right. We got, it's an item of property other than real estate. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so, so like here, the cows, like the, the farmers own their cows. It's the same thing. People. Yeah. In legal papers though, um, yeah. people that were indentured slaves were yes. considered chattel. So it's rooted yes. in, and this is why it's being taught at Malcolm X. And, uh, and so it is a word that where you do need to have that context yeah. and it's a word that doesn't get passed around enough now outside of the black American community, because not all black Americans are from African heritage. And, uh, and I'm just one of those people that everyone I know still considers themselves. That's of darker skin. They just say black. Like I say, I'm white, you know, I'm clearly yeah. not white. Just so <laughs> you know, the definition the definition for human chattel is human beings considered property. That is slaves. And if you yes. look in, if you read the legalese and come to understand what's said about the citizens of the United States, they are considered under the corporate United States to be chattel. Exactly. And so it, 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 it's interesting. Can you, is Malcolm X a college? What I've never heard of. Yeah. This, it's a college it? in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting to me because so you went there, right? I, I did. To, to, mm-hmm. This is person who's a black a hero to many black people. Right. Mm-hmm. And they think, you know, it, it, people's perception of who Malcolm X was and what he was really saying, I think, is probably far off from what he, who he really was and what he was really saying, as of it course. is with most of these people. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things, and I've experienced this, I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here, but I'm, I'm just going to do well, it. Well, this whole right? conversation is kind of trigger re. <laughs> yeah. So, um, trigger you know, there are people in my family who I love very much, whose field of expertise and study have things to do with race relations, right? And when I speak about some of these uh, political items or conspiratorial items, and when I bring up the idea that we are all slaves, they find that very offensive because yes. it is, it, that it is somehow making smaller the experience of what most people think of as slaves and those were in black people, black people who are working on plantation brought over here from Africa in chains, working on plantations and we're not free. And so Which does no service to everyone else that went through hardcore slavery too. I mean, uh, seriously. A, a, that, absolutely that. But then it brings up this other thing. And this was, I was, I uh, had a little road trip with the gang to Tucson. And some, one of the best things about road trips is the conversations that happen and occur and whatever. Right. And one of the topics of conversations and I've had it with other people is like those, those African slaves or those black slaves or other slaves of other ethnicities and, or even white slaves. People of time, color is the kind of people, the Yeah. Pops. The way they think of historic slaves, right. Those people knew they were slaves. Right. 
and and we were talking about this in terms of like people in other countries like i have one friend from iran who's like she moved here at you know when she was late teenage years right so she was understood well enough the political situation in iran she said what happens here is much more insidious because people in iran know they're not free and the people here think they are so they go about their day making their decisions thinking they're free because they have iphones and they can say whatever they want and they can smoke pot and all of that kind of stuff and they think that's freedom so there's this thing that like when these people were on plantations or were indentured servants in the way that it's classically been thought of they understood that that was their predicament people today of every single race we are all the same we are all the same now you know yes. what i mean and people yes. think because they it's entertaining because they have entertainment and because they can do some cool shit that that's freedom and they don't realize what has actually happened it isn't that those other people were made free it was that everybody has now been into you know because it's more of a technological enslavement like a sort of um, financial, legalese, technological kind of enslavement than one where it's like, you can't leave this, you know, this plantation, even though it is, it's like that. People don't understand what's happening. And that in some ways is like really scary, you know, like it, it, that people just wander around looking at their phones, smoking pot, not without a worry in the world. Meanwhile, there's this open air prison that's been constructed around them. Well, we it, modern modern people in Western society pay for it. We want everyone wants mm -hmm. that new iPhone. Everybody want you know, like everyone's paying for it, and it, it, you know now people are starting to question it. I mean, you can say a lot of bad things. I personally can say a lot of bad things about Portland, Oregon. But one of the things that just made me go rock on Portland is they're they're saying no, we don't want five G right now, and huh. let's look at it. And they're also yeah. saying we don't want constant surveillance is a mm -hmm. thing, and so. So that's, you know, this is, this is a, a mass event where people are saying, let's pull back the reins on this. Well, and that's awesome. Unfortunately, Portland's such a shit show otherwise, but that's awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, I call it the shambles, but it, it's, it's soft core. It's, it's like that soft core type of slavery that we're in and we're mm -hmm. in it planetary wide and as we know looking back at some of the more esoteric texts this stuff was in the making you know well over 100 years ago with certain societies this stuff was being talked about and uh and it, it's always behooves those that are in power to allow those that are not empowered the enslaved to feel as if they're free range right yeah. i had and my great example is just chickens i have a great yard but it's still in a small town and it's still not acres and acres and i my chickens are free range technically uh but they don't penetrate the boundary of my cottage they never leave it and so where they're free to do so, they don't do it. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is and why that is, but they are free to go where they want. So they, they could truly be free range, but it's somehow in whatever mechanism they are, they see the, the sidewalk mm -hmm. and, and, and fences and stuff they can get around and they don't even try. Oh, well, that's fascinating. And I mean, <laughs> but you could say the same thing about, the American people at this point. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm totally. using that I mean, as an analogy. Yeah, you no, know, yeah, I get, it, but that, you know, like we think of like, okay, like people don't realize, but there's this invisible barrier, right? But even, but even when there's an obvious visual barrier and a way around it, most of them still don't go. People are much more interested in breaking into things than breaking out of things in our culture. Right? And, and we'll look at how much people want, they want more bigger government. They want to be nannied and governed and they want to feel safe. And what's all this mean? This means you feed this system that's controlling you. This means that this governance becomes a bigger monster and now it's employing more people and everyone wants their secure government job with their government benefits and it, it just the monster continues to grow and eventually it's the minority of people that don't 
work for the government, right? And so you start talking like cutting back on government uh, uh, programs and all these people that are the minority, the majority that are getting paid from the government are of course going to go on the side of what's giving them their comfort, right? Their their stability. Do you think there's the chickens, like there are some kind of mechanism? Do you think that like, the chickens do like what people are doing right now, where so far the government hasn't actually started censoring. And even though some of the big tech companies are doing it, they're not fully doing it. The most amount of censorship happens from cancel culture or from being shouted down by insane people or from self-censoring because you've already been shouted down and it wasn't pleasant so you don't do it again. So do you think that like the chickens like yap and yell and scream at one who wanders off or that there's like a like a, an internal internal cohesive collective thing that one doesn't feel like they can be bold and break away from the rest of the the rest of their group. Uh, my observation with birds that flock is they for safety they like to go places together, and it's very rare that one will be more curious on its own because there are predators, and so. Uh, you know, the, I don't know, but I mean, I, have you seen, I think, I can't remember if Jerry posted this or not. I think, I'm sure Jerry did. Uh, but there, you know, how meat is, and this goes right into all the stuff you and Randy talked about for years, programmed into their DNA uh, that we eat the program too. So it trickles down. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. so in cattle and in chicken yeah. and all this d- domesticated uh, animals that people are eating, that that's, they're eating the program too. I wonder, I wonder how, if chickens used to be like that, or if they've become more like that as they've been fed cor- like corn instead of eating grass and bugs, right? Like literally, <laughs> I mean, my mind goes right to this shit, right? Like as they become corn fed and in these factory farms and eating GMO and all of that kind of stuff, which I, you know, everyone knows, I think that that's a programmed kind of food, a digitally programmed kind of food on a certain level or chemically programmed. Which also equals slavery. Totally. But then they're eating that. And so they're now like, you know, even a lot of quote unquote free range chickens still are fed you know, at least a partially a corn diet or whatever. So that's in there and they're probably not eating organic corn. And so then we're eating chicken. Cause one of the things that, and maybe I'm, I'm not into chicken, dude. I, I, unless it's fried, don't show me chicken. Um, but, uh, people think that that's like, you know, there's a lot of people who like, that's their main thing. Like that's the food they love. That's their most comfortable food or the one that they think is the healthiest or best for them or whatever. Right. Like, <laughs> Programmable chickens. Oi. Um, yeah, well, I was, I really loved seeing that. I cannot recall. I'm positive I actually saw that through Jerry, but then when I went and looked it up, you know, it made Drudge Report and there's like stuff, you know, I think it made, it was, it trickled down from like a journal study for whatever that's worth because we understand now how all that goes. At one time, I thought journals were the, you know, the standard. <laughs> <laughs> so this makes me think also of cattle mutilations, right? The cow, remember like those cattle mutilations that were happening a lot for yes. a while, right? And they often are around like where there's been UFO sightings or alien sightings or things like that. This is actually, <laughs> this was actually what first, first, the first back and forth Randy and I ever had was about cattle mutilations. It was a, long before I ever joined him as a, as a, co-host or became friends with him it was like you know maybe two years before that or a year before that and he had done a show with I, I, maybe it was and jerry you were trying to think of this person's name when you were on conspiracy normal the one who does the thing about the emv is it his name is james horak. james horak james yeah. horak yeah we were, we were listening to that today and i was like it's james horak jerry it's james horak but they were talking about cattle mutilations and i had some i don't even remember what i said but i always thought cattle mutilations were interesting because um I have a great a cousin who was the first person in the United States to die of mad cow disease or Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and I always felt like there was some connection between these cattle mutilations and the mad cow disease. And it's making me think with what you're saying about the chickens here. If these cattle mutilations, like right, because they find they find these cows that have been completely hollowed out, 
if something or someone is taking the inside of the cows out to find out what's the microbiome, the bacterium, the things that, that's in there, because people, you know, people know that like beef is like the American thing, the thing that most people are eating, so they can understand what people's insides are being programmed with, right? Like if there wasn't exterior, external intelligence, or if the, whether it's alien or whether it's uh, an, until some other faction that we're not aware of here on Earth, and they're trying to understand either what's going on with the people because they're acting so crazy or that they want to be, be able to somehow influence that, that that would be, you know, and of course they always like to cover up everything and say it's a UFO thing or an alien thing, right? To make everyone look crazy who talks about it. Yeah, totally. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know, like it, 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 to, to, if they examine the inside of cows, right? And, you know, the, and people and hamburg meat and all that kind of stuff is the most common the, you know, hamburgers are the American meal, then you understand, you, you either understand what's going on with the American people, or then you have the ability to influence it if you're trying to do so from outside, right? That's weird. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's that old adage, um, you are what you eat. And, mm -hmm. and I've always pulled up to that information. And now, you know, at this particular cross junction in time. I understand that it's such a deeper level having dealt with Hashimoto's and, you know, and just my own health and having to go down my own path towards healing and, uh, and dealing with wakening up to the fuckery of, uh, the allopathic system. So yeah, there, there's definitely tie-ins to all that. And as I look back now and this is what's funny but the, this also brings in all that whole ai conversation but is i there were markers all along for me in my life that were these little red flags like i was very early on not wanting to eat meat very early and i'm, mm -hmm. I'm from iowa mm -hmm. you know i mean we <laughs> were known for really great cattle and pigs and corn mm -hmm. and uh and so i was i had a very bad distaste and i many 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 scenes in my life where they're making me eat meat and i didn't want to eat it as a little kid and so and at the time i remember this clearly i just couldn't wrap myself around eating the muscles of something mm -hmm. like so, it was more it was on that level yeah. so i wasn't even thinking about animal uh how they're cared for i wasn't even anywhere near that level or what they're eating i was just repulsed by eating muscles because I knew that those things were on me too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that was like a big deal. And so that's one of those red flags looking back though. I wonder if there was something inherent in me that knew. Yes. So that I, was I was getting some sort of bad download from the meat. I would say absolutely. Yes. Like I have some stuff like that. Like I happen to, like, I just, I don't like chicken. Right. Like I just like, I really don't like chicken. I and, don't eat, I don't eat birds. Yeah. I, I really don't like chicken. And there's a couple, sometimes you just innately know, but one of the things I found out at a certain point was that, it, you know, if you, if you ascribe to the blood type diet, which I don't totally like, don't, I think there's interesting things in there is that my blood type actually does not do well with chicken. Right. And, and so like my, something in my little kid body, already knew that I don't like this, even though it doesn't make me ill or make me not feel well or anything like that. Right. But I think the same, but you inherently know what blood I, type are you, by the way, I'm uh, B positive. Okay. Uh, I'm B positive, which I, uh, I just found that out recently. I didn't know what my blood type was for a long time and, or I maybe knew once and forgot, but I actually think it's a possibility that my blood type changed which is a thing that I've been talking about with people as well, too, is I think that's a thing. I think people's blood types can change. Um, but my, I, I didn't realize that it's actually kind of a, a rare blood type, that there aren't very many people. It's the least common blood type in uh, America amongst Caucasians, but it's fairly common among Jews, right? So, and I'm, you know, I'm part Jewish and whatnot. Um, but, uh, and Are you part Ashkenazi? Oh, I, I call it Ashkenazi um, <laughs> that, that's closer to the truth Ashkenazi my brother, um, my brother did a 23 and me and found out he was 25% Ashkenazi which shocked everyone in our family yeah so um, it, I'll have two things to say about that 
Um, so yeah, so I call it Ashkenazi, but yes, according to, I've never had, I won't do any of those tests. Um, that is the, the handed down history that I've heard from my family. I, however, look very different than a lot of people in my family. Like I actually look closer to a, a Middle Eastern person, or if, if you're talking about Jews, like a Sephardic person, right? Because I have dark skin and like the super light eyes, but they're different than most Jews, blue, blue eyes, right? I look much more like I'm from a Middle Eastern country. You know what I mean? Um, in some ways, especially in the summer when I get very dark and no one else in my family is like that. Um, so I think there's a couple of things going on. Like if your brother and he's your full brother is 25% Ashkenazi and you're not, then like, what is this? How much of our DMA is programmed? And is it programmed by the things we eat, the information that we take in, the things that we've been involved in, the experience we've had? Is our DNA, if it's mutatable by virus and by GMO food, why wouldn't it be mutatable by these other things? You have people who are on the up and up side of things like, you know, Bruce Lipton and Joe Dispenza and whatever that say on a certain level, we do have control over that aspect of ourselves. Well, if we do and we're not doing it, someone else is going to be happy to do it. So I think that that's both weird and possible. Um, but yes, I, yes, according to my family's history, I have Ashkenazi blood, which also means I'm a genius then. They're supposed to be the highest IQ people in the world. So there you go. Well, that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, but no, so I think that resistance, I mean, I went through a very vegetarian phase and stuff too, you know, for a long time. Um, I'm going to, you know, since this, you guys are weird and I'm weird, so I'm just going to say it. I was listening to this video a couple weeks ago about people who get fecal plant transplants. Have you heard about this? No, yep. what I okay, don't know so, how to fecal transplant. I didn't either. I was it's listening exactly to, like it sounds. I was listening because <laughs> I'm curious about like issues with the micro, microbiome and people digestive issues and enzymes, you know, kind of stuff like this, right? So, somebody, this woman had to have a fecal. Like, I guess she, there was some problem. She had had stomach issues or whatever, you know, for a very long time. She had always been a lean, lean person. Right. And something had happened and she just had di having endless diarrhea, or endless digestive and problems with going to the bathroom and whatever. And I guess this is something that isn't that uncommon. So I'm going to do some more research on this at some point, but they, they actually will do fecal transplants to change because that changing of the bacterial makeup of that, of the intestine, right. Will change whatever's going on for you. So she had, her daughter had no problems there. So they transplant, they did a fecal transplant from the daughter's body to the mother, but the daughter was extremely overweight. And after her feces had been transplanted into her mother, now the mother's stomach and digestive issues were, were fixed, but now she was, now she became obese too, right? So there is something very, I talked about this on the show with Sophia Smallstorm one time too. We talked about like our microbiomes are really important and it's part of tribalism. Like people, and sometimes when people are resistant to people that are different from them, it isn't because they're naturally mean or hate people or against people that are different, but there's something in their body that is saying, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. This microbiome doesn't match up with yours. These things are not in sync and that could create health problems, right? And that may, that may be a reason why tribalism was so strong in the past. And it may be part of this push to both deteriorate cultures, but also deteriorate people's health is have everybody all mixed in and living far away from the place that they were, that they're from. Right. Because there's also theories that people have a lot of health problems when they eat foods that aren't natural to the area. Like if they eat foods that were not grown within 500 miles of the area they originated from. Right. So even if you moved to like, let's say this, you moved from Iowa to California. Right. But if you still ate the same kinds of food that they ate in Iowa, then that would be better for you than if you're eating things that like people who are from California or from Mexico or whatever. eat. Right. That there's something about those foods that are better for your microbiome or that keeps things in sync. I don't know. That, if that just makes sense. I mean, yeah, I've heard people say this before that, you know, eat local, eat where you live, because though the, the microorganisms in your local environment are also in you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, and it, this it all just also, makes sense. This could also go to like how cultural tension is developed. It wasn't really so much that you hate these other people, but there's a tension around them because it's, it's something different. And then because people didn't understand that, right, it created this other social thing around it, right? And so there are aspects of tribalism 
that actually would be better for people's wellness and health. And so of course they don't want to, you know, they don't want to, um, they don't want to uh, encourage that. Um, I also wonder with some of this stuff, like with the microbiome and the bacteria, right? And the things with the cattle mutilations, if they've been learning about how to influ how what's inside the animal influences the people in other ways besides just they eat the food and they're healthy or not healthy, but this, you know, programming, your DNA, the mind control, all this other kind of stuff, how much have they learned from that with the real animals and how much have they moved that over to these lab created meats like Impossible Burger and the Beyond Meat, right? Because we're seeing kinds of all these weird this is a different kind of like fake meat or vegetarian product than we've ever seen before that's having a different kind of social and cultural reach and also is like it's got a whole ecosystem going on inside of it with all this yeast and pea protein and the bacteria that grows around that and this whole it, it, it oh, it's, it's setting it's up a system inside the body it's not meat but it almost feels like they're trying to um recreate some of these problems that could be in the, the chicken or the beef, right? But they're also pushing this vegan thing, and I know why they're pushing the vegan thing. And it, it really has to do with um, cell wall integrity because there are certain aspects of cell wall integrity that require cholesterol that's only available from animal products. Right. And this portion, this aspect of cell wall integrity is, if, if that's intact, it's going to make people harder to be controlled by 5G and things like that. Right, so there's a reason that 5G and veganism are being pushed in, together at the same time, right? And while you have people like Adam Schiff pushing both, right? You always see you see that a lot in the <laughs> political kind of thing. Adam but Schiff. they're to even, <laughs> all right. That's a whole other. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. But this stuff with the food is getting really weird. I mean, it, we're like it's like soiling green time. You know the the interesting thing about the Beyond Meat stuff is that it's kind. Of, what did I read? 18 million times more estrogen in it. Mm -hmm. And with the declining fertility rates mm -hmm. in, in males around the world, that's just, those kind of products are just going to make it even worse. I haven't gotten to watch it yet, but I saw there was a video from Sean Baker, who's the guy, a doctor who pushes the carnivore diet, where he's tearing apart some new interview about the impossible burger or the beyond meat. Bill Gates, of course, is pushing that, right? Of course. So, of course. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this stuff all, like, it, it is literally, like, political, a political food product at this point, right? It is literally a food product, product that was created to push a social and political agenda that, 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 you know, they can't find another way to make happen, so now they're doing it this way. Hmm. Also, though, I want to say this on this processed vegan stuff. It's really, and amongst, and I was vegan a long time, I'm not any longer, but, uh, it's uh, to a lot of real vegans out there. I mean, I hate to say real, but to a lot of vegans out there, that stuff is it's junk cool. food. Totally, I agree. It's but not, not these new junk trendy food. vegans. So, not these new trendy vegans. They love it. Well, because I mean, it's the same as any other person going to McDonald's, and yeah. and now you know everyone can now go to Burger King or wherever serves that. Yeah. sandwich because it's all junk food all of it absolutely yeah. all of it and um but what i you did say something key earlier and that really really looks so apparent to me and so is so transparent is uh the soylent green dynamic that was seated long ago in the 70s is, is here we're definitely mm -hmm. in that time span that that was speaking to mm -hmm. yep I agree. There's, a, there's a product named Soylent Green for Christ's sakes. Right. Well, and look at the shortages now, whether they were created, you know, that's a whole different show, intentionally or not. Food shortages, this next, you know, from this last cycle of growing and now all this stuff in China and Africa and um, I'll clearly here in the food basket, uh, it's food's going to be way, way, way more expensive expensive starting this summer moving forward rice beans all of it you know i've been hearing this for years and it never happens well but for years we haven't had major wipeouts jerry we have had major wipeouts china is shut down 
And the Midwest, the farmers and stuff in Iowa and down in there that I know, they're, they had no, nothing. I mean, it was, it, it's been terrible. They're, the Midwest was flooded for half the summer. Uh, so, and then California was on fire. And I mean, there's like, there, there definitely are shortages going on. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a narrative, but if you, if you bring it home, and you look at where the food's produced, and then you start looking at what's happening. It it could have just been bollocks in the past, but this last year, stuff really happened all over that affected the food growth. So, you know, affected food. Jerry, let me ask you something. I, I like, just think it renders. I don't know. I don't know if it's actually. There's so much food available it's just hard to believe that it's all produced you know <laughs> but I, but you say that in your comfortable spot in georgia you know what i'm saying <laughs> i like your accent there um jerry let me ask you this though what kind of market do you shop at and, and do you eat or are you are you shopping at like a, i mean uh, what's the big market i, I go to kroger i you shop kroger. at kroger you shop, and and I, do you eat organic I don't eat completely organic, but I buy organic things when I when it's available. Okay, so I think that like I my food's always expensive because we have options here that are very enticing and and so some of them are just um, luxury items that I engage in. But one of the reasons that I do engage in the luxury items is because at this point, if I just like there's a market here that I've spoken about a lot on the air called Erewhon that I really like that has just everything that. You know, it, it makes eating healthy fun, right? Is that nowhere spelled backwards? You got it. Yeah. And so, um, and it is an interesting place. It's interesting characters there. Um, and it's got an interesting story about how it developed. But one of the reasons that I go there as opposed to going to the regular market or, or even Whole Foods sometimes, the stuff there isn't as nice or as special as an Erewhon. But my experience is it really is almost as expensive and it, the, the shopping experience and all that kind of stuff is not nearly as pleasant. So there was a time when you saved a lot of money if you went to Ralph's, which we have Ralph's here, which is Kroger. It's the same thing, right? They're owned by the same company. Um, right. That you, you know, where it, 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 but now it's not really that much more at the other place. Like prices of organic vegetables, even in the standard supermarkets, you know what I mean? Or trying to find, they sometimes have a little bit of grass fed meat or a little bit of organic meat, but it never looks great. And it's almost as expensive as at the place that has the really good stuff. So I do think, it, and then the other thing is that there are, even though there's all this food available, there's a lot of places that have are like food deserts because for some reason they don't ship those foods there. So for them, it's hard to find it. And it is really expensive if they can, even though there might be plenty being produced somewhere else. So some of this is just a, um, you know, a, a, what is the supply chain kind of issue, right? Like yeah, there may yeah. be the supplies, but there's not the chain to bring it to certain places. So people have to pay a lot more for it. Um, it is a thing, but I agree with you. It's also been used as a fear tactic and it affects organics much more than it affects conventionals because Monsanto and all those companies intentionally make products that withstand some of these natural issues and the organics can't. Right? Right. And it's hard to even trust some of these manufacturers to be truthful about their labeling. Plus, And that's come out too. Yeah, right. Not to mention, there's a lot of things that are labeled non-GMO, which are not organic. They're, they're not organic. Not they'll, yeah. Or they'll say these products are natural or something, but they're not. Right. There's yeah. all kinds of chicanery going on. Okay. So, so just, you know, I don't know. So we're at the end of the first hour here, and this was a completely different set of topics than I expected to talk about, but that was kind of awesome and really great. I do I do want to stick with what we talked about for the second hour, so people please move on over to patreon.com forward slash media to hear the rest of the conversation, and we're going to dig deep into the Nox Mente of the, uh, <laughs> of the inner world. But um, Nish, there was one topic that I had wanted to talk about with you and that I know you wanted to talk about that we didn't get to, and that's sort of the more um, esoteric stuff going on with some of these viruses, the virus, as you've been calling it. Um, and so I, I may have to have you back uh, together or, or separate or whatever to, so we can hit on that sometime soon, because I do think there's something interesting in what you've been developing around that. So I Yeah, oh, no problem. I can, okay. I can chat on that any day. Okay, so before we move over to the patron section, why don't you 
A, tell people about, your, you guys have a new show called Obelisk that you do together is in addition to Nox Mente. Tell people a little bit about that and then tell people where they can find you, please. Okay. Yeah, the new show we do once a month. So we do three Nox Mentes a month and then we do one Obelisk show, which is on the week of the full moon. Um, so whatever week the full moon is on, that's the week we do it that Wednesday night. It's in the same time slot as our Nox Mente show. And the obelisk is more not dream. It's, it's completely not dream related. So it's the opposite of our other show, but we bring out like this week we had this past week during the snow moon, we had Walter Bosley on to talk about his new book and a, a bunch of other stuff, which it was a great conversation lasted two and a half hours. It's on our feed. We put this out as a podcast as well. Cool. It's fantastic. And it's just now, I feel like we're just getting our stride on it. Yeah. And uh, it, it, I really, I can't wait for the next one. It's it's kind of like this show was tonight. We we, we kind of have an idea where we want to go, but where it goes, it goes. Right. It just I almost goes wanna, where it goes. I almost got to have this inkling to flip it and do three obelisks a month and one Knox Monte. <laughs> I know, or maybe like every other week, do something like that. That way we could catch the new moon and the full moon, Jar. Right, and we could get more people on that we want to talk to. Um, yeah, so we might be shifting people. We might be yeah. doing that because Jerry and I are both really loving the obelisk. Yeah, I love it. It's a fantastic show. But we love Nox Monte too, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Anyway, awesome. um, you can find us on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is called Vocus Nocte, which is Latin for Night Voices. Or you can just Google Nox Mente or go to noxmente.com to uh, get all the links to all of our stuff. And Nish, will you tell people uh, who would like to go over and look at some of your uh, interesting uh, music videos or some of your interesting art where they can find that? Yeah, I. so if you just go to Nox Mente's uh, YouTube channel, we have listed your hosts, which is you can get to Jerry's YouTube page and my YouTube page. So there, my niche page, my personal page, will take you to an extravaganza of eccentric experimental music that all started with us. Uh, beat jazz really it all st started with spoken word and i started experimenting with music now it's full on music videos and one of the things that's interesting with it is i present information i have about the fuckery around us via the form of art experimental art music and anyone who liked throbbing gristle and yoko ono and just the underground of music especially electronica music digs what i do because that's the realm and it's pushing it but what i'm telling are narratives so you're not going to get love songs from me and you're not going to get breakup songs what you're going to get is some <laughs> deep right emily you're going to get some yeah. deep woo and some deep in intel that I have, that I actually have, and I'm getting 100% hits on some of these. Uh, and then some of the stuff so old that people don't realize they're connected, like yeah. Elizabeth Short, The Black Dahlia, 1947, yeah. mm -hmm. to, to all, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that unfolded in that year, and people have kept it separate. That so stuff all happened in the area of downtown in Los Angeles, where a lot of the underground evening activities occur. Yes, right now. yes, and Emily. You can feel I can still feel that. Like you can still like I think I've talked about this before on on a show, but like when I go to parties in some of these old buildings, they are haunted, and I can see the people that were like in those buildings in like back in the twenties, forties, fifties, or whatever, out of the corner of my eyes like for, for little moments here and there right the, yeah the the, the 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 veil the ether is different there and there's crossover and it is weird and that feeling of the, that time when that was all going on is very much present still both in like the downtown area of los angeles and the hollywood era that is that is not so and i heard you guys talking about this on the conspiracy normal thing there like we have to really get over this idea of linear time yes <laughs> that's know? a big deal <laughs> yeah totally all right guys so go check all that we're going to take a quick pause and we'll meet you over on the other side for patreon
This is Off Planet Radio. Thank you. 